Um, this is uh, James Stanger and Ashley Kraft and Eric Meyer for um, for cert certification partners uh, for the CIW uh, webcast Flash Silverlight and HTML Hype Reality and Your Career. Um, what we're doing is uh, starting a webcast. We've lost Lisa Harnish at least for the time being. And what I'd uh, like to do is make sure, Ashley, are you still with us? Uh, yep, I believe so. Good. Eric, are you still with us? Yep. Okay. Well, what we're going to do is uh, start the webcast. I'm uh, excited to have you two on board. What we're going to do is I want to show you the agenda. Uh, we're going to talk first a little bit about what CIW is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Eric and Ashley's background. Uh, then we're going to talk about possibly some criteria for choosing the technology path for creating rich internet applications, because that's effectively what we're talking about here, things having to do with Flash, HTML5, et cetera. Talk about some of these different uh, technology paths and how you can uh, start to get there with CIW. Lisa, are you back on? Yes, uh, I am yes. here, James. Can oh, you hear me now? Oh, good. I can yes. hear you now. Sorry, James. I'm not hey, sure what happened there. I apologize. Hey, it's the web. Or we're fine. Well, the internet at any rate, so no worries. It's voice over IP, right? We'll blame it on that. Yeah. yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we'll do is I'll, I'm going to start with a brief uh, commercial, everybody. Uh, and by the way, I want to remind everybody that you will get a, P, a PDF of this PowerPoint slide. Uh, we're being recorded right now. And uh, you can uh, go up and take a, uh, and listen and watch uh, this particular presentation uh, after we put it up a, a few days after this, after this event. Uh, you're muted by default. If you wish to ask any questions at all, please feel free to put it, uh, the question into the chat window, and Lisa Harnish will uh, uh, make sure those questions get to us. So let's get going. So what is CIW? We are a skills-based education certification program. We take a holistic approach to design and development. We offer courses and certification exams about web development and design. We're vendor neutral. We grab the best vendor applications as judged by industry, from open source to all of the things that you would expect uh, from Adobe, uh, for example. We take a competency-based approach to, approach to education. The idea is that we put people on a, a lifelong learning path in terms of web design and web development, as opposed to any one vendor's uh, particular product treadmill. We're globally accepted with over 60,000 uh, individuals, and these are people who are uh, worldwide. It's a program created by experts in the web. We have a community of people of over 200,000 web professionals and a global presence. The design that goes into our exams and into our courseware uh, is supported and uh, added to by people with uh, university, community college, and high school education. We listen to them carefully about the features that we need to add. Who uses CIW? Universities worldwide, including Kaplan, Western Governors University, the University of West of Scotland, New Hebei University in China, as well as secondary and community colleges and further education colleges around the globe, and as well as learning centers. CIW is, uh, is adopted worldwide because we make sure to include a cross-section or a nexus of industry, academia, government, and not-for-profit organizations to help give input as to the technologies that we cover. So University of Phoenix, University of the West of Scotland, people from the state of Virginia, for example, um, uh, those from the University of uh, uh, New Hebei University, Google, HP, and elsewhere, all help contribute to make CIW what it is. As a result, CIW has been named a top developer certification. Uh, uh, Internet.com has recommended CIW as one of the top five certifications that puts web developers on a career fast track because when you combine the in-demand skill sets that CIW gives as well as proven salary impact, CIW gives people the ability to prove their worth. Well, let's talk a bit uh, about uh, Ashley and Eric, who I'm very pleased uh, uh, to have you two aboard. How are you doing, Ashley? I'm doing great. Glad to be good, here. Good, man. Yeah, good, good to have you here. And Eric, how are you doing? We were chatting earlier about uh, an event apart. But, uh, so how's things going there in Cleveland? Uh, beautifully cool and clear. All right. Well, it's, uh, 
it's uh, glad to have you aboard as well. Eric Meyer is a web developer um, and uh, and uh, and also a web designer. is a recognized author. Uh, back in 2006, wrote the definitive guide for CSS for O'Reilly, and uh, in in uh, 2010 here has just created Smashing CSS, uh, which basically goes over professional layout. Uh, so uh, congratulations on the new book, man. Hey, thanks. And uh, you know, most people I, uh, who are into CSS and things would know you because you uh, were the, uh, one of the invited uh, authors, were you not, in the creation of the CSS2 standard. Is that right? Yeah, I was in what the W3C calls an invited expert. Um, okay. People who are not employed by uh, W3C members like Microsoft or Google or, or whoever, but who a working group feels is expert enough to say, come on, be a part of the working group. You can sit in on the face-to-face -face meetings, and et cetera. So, so Eric, uh, just wanted to make sure that you, everybody understands that Eric has been involved in the creation of, uh, of, of the CSS standard with the W3C. You also are the co-founder of a uh, conference called, or a series of conferences, I guess, called An Event Apart. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, they're, um, they're, they're, well, they're sort of mid, what I think of as a mid-sized conference. Mm -hmm. uh, we have six of them coming in 2011 uh, all around the United States. And the, the audience is really people who are uh, intermediate to expert in the web, um, what I sometimes call web craftsmen, people who not only know how to create websites but are passionate about it, who love the web and love what they do and always want to do what they do better. So. And uh, and if you uh, you've been also working uh, in the web and very deeply for the last seventeen years. I mean, we could almost say twenty years at this point, right? Sad so. but true. <laughs> so, everybody just wanted to, uh, as we talk about this discussion of uh, various ways to do rich internet applications, wanted to give everybody a sense of. Uh, you know, what, what these profiles are and what, uh, where Eric and Ashley come from. If you want to learn more about Eric, you can go to MeyerWeb.com. Well, Ashley uh, is an expert developer and designer and is a CIW Grandmaster Developer, which basically means she has taken and passed every single CIW uh, exam there is. So she has a tremendous understanding not only of design and development, but of the uh, underlying architecture uh, of the internet that ma uh, makes it all possible. So Ashley, tell us a bit more about yourself. Uh, you know, you currently work as our web architect at Certification Partners, and you're also an instructor. Tell us more about your uh, what you do as an instructor for Mesa Community College. Well, over at Mesa, I teach the uh, Web Foundations Associate Program. Um, it really helps students in troubleshooting any issues that may be occurring with their websites and getting them up and understanding the core values from a business standpoint on e-commerce sites. The other course that I teach is Web Design Specialist. <clears throat> it's the third level of web design and development over at Mesa Community College and it really helps round out the more intermediate level of designing and development for students who are pursuing uh, a degree in web design. Ashley, tell us more about the, uh, the uh, extensive experience that you've had working as a web architect or, or putting together solutions for uh, not only uh, certification partners but other companies. Well, when um, I've been doing sites for other companies and architecting web solutions for them, I found that my uh, CIW Grandmaster Developer experience actually really helped a lot in figuring out what was necessary and what was required for each individual project that I've worked on. Each uh, company always has their own issues in trying to get things to incorporate and knowing how things in the background work together really helps me out a lot. You know, yeah, I think uh, uh, one thing that we were talking about yesterday was the idea that uh, that with the CIW approach, because it teaches that holistic, uh, you know, all of the things that are involved, it allows people to kind of look around the corner of their problems, be much more proactive uh, concerning uh, things that might be going on, uh, you know, in the in the future, and that way you can uh, you kind of anticipate issues. Yeah, I definitely now, agree. 
Now, okay, so what we've got here are two people who are experts in what they do, not only from an author perspective and from a teacher perspective with, with Ashley, but people who have been designing various types of solutions using various types of technologies for many years. And what I want to do is get uh, the two of you in a discussion talking more about what it means to choose a particular technology path in creating rich internet applications and what Flash, HTML5, Silverlight, and things like this can do for your career. And one of the things that we have talked about like, offline, uh, Eric and Ashley both, is the importance when you're choosing a particular technology path to make sure that the support, the, that the platform that you want to choose is supported properly uh, in terms of things like market penetration. How much is this particular technology used out in the world? What software and devices support it and things of that nature? Eric. When it comes to uh, uh, you know the the penetration uh, market penetration out there, is that a factor that you consider, or are there other factors that you think are are important? Um, I mean, I I suppose I would consider it to some degree, depending on the project. Um, but to mm -hmm. me, um, my baseline is whether or not something's what I would call web native. Is it a technology that is inherent to the web? Um, have things like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, um, you know, stuff that doesn't rely on a plugin necessarily. That's where I that's where I start, um, you know. And then yeah. whatever can be done that way, you know, I would do. And then if if something can't be done using those or can't be done, let's say, sufficiently easily with those technologies, then perhaps look in other areas. But then you're talking to somebody who, you know, once wrote his own HTML, CSS, and JavaScript based slideshow rather than use PowerPoint. So <laughs> I might go a little bit further than most people would down that road. <laughs> so the, uh, the idea of the web native, I, I think it's a, it's a great, uh, you know, metaphor idea that you have. So the idea is that even though uh, Microsoft, they, cre they created the uh, uh, XML, HTTP request, you know, object and things. The fact that it's become so ubiquitous, right, uh, over the years, and that's something that allows AJAX, for example, and things like JavaScript. All of these are ways that you feel are, are you know, really effective ways to get things going because, again, they have become native to the web. Ashley, your perspective on that? What, what kind of, you know, from a, you know, technology choice perspective? What are some of the factors that are really important for you? Um, I definitely agree that uh, being native to the web can help you in choosing what technology you want. Um, from my perspective, though, I really am concerned with user compatibility and whether or not the users will be able to easily access what I'm putting out there, and also how long it's going to take in development. So trying to match those two up and see what the best um, best technology in that situation might be. So although market penetration can be helpful with things such as Flash, which is widely used, uh, differing technology actually might really do what I need it to. And both of you kind of brought up this idea, Ashley, that it kind of has to do with the, the audience. You need to understand exactly what audience you're developing your particular solution to, whether it be a web page or whatever application. Do you care to expand a bit more about how you find out what that audience is? There are a lot of web statistics out there that can give you an idea of what your traffic is in a certain site or what your demographic potentially will be. And you can start making some basic uh, ideas on what, what kind of group is going to be seeing your site and what their capabilities are technology-wise. Eric, anything uh, more about that, the idea of finding out exactly you know, what your audience is and, and uh, you know, whether they can handle the technologies in what, that you want to use? Yeah, I mean, if you have an existing site, you just my thing is look at your user logs, right? If half of your audience is using Netscape 4, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's <laughs> something you need to know, right? Or if all of your audience is using Internet Explorer 6, 7, and 8, you know, and literally you get nothing else, then that tells you something else. I mean, if you're creating a new site, you do have to make some educated guesses. You can use things like, you know, browser 
share, st you know, sort of quote unquote global browser statistics. Um, but I, you know, I would much rather rely on who's coming to this to a site than than some sort of theoretical global picture, you know, because you take my personal website for an example, my user statistics look nothing like you know, the 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 stuff that you see kicked around in the media, you know, oh, Internet Explorer has dropped below 70%. It's like, yeah, right, Internet Explorer that. dropped below 17%, you know, 17% a year ago or whatever. So, um, you know, there's that. But the, the, the one thing to watch out for that is when you look at your user's statistics, you have to be sure that any browser that shows up in your statistics, especially if it's a very small percentage, that your site actually works in that browser. So if you see let's say 1% Opera users. You should load up your site in Opera, and if your site completely fails to work, like nobody can do anything with your site in Opera, then there might be a reason why it's only 1%. So that you always have to have that sanity check. You can't just look at the numbers and say, oh, Opera 1%, I don't care. You have to, like, you have to go and look at your site and make sure that it works in that browser. And if it does and it's still 1%, then that tells you one thing. And if it doesn't, then you need to make sure that people can get to it. And then you might have 10% Opera users, or it might still be 1%, I don't know. So in that way, you, you worry less about things like corporation support or what other technologies are optimized by using a particular application. You worry more about uh, who's visiting the site and why and then making sure everything works well in it. Well, my experience is typically with public sites. I don't have okay. to deal with, I, I almost never, I've almost never worked on internet sites. And that's okay. a whole different thing, right? If, you're st if your company is standardized on exactly one browser and the only people who will ever touch that site only use that one okay. browser, then you know you don't have to worry about the fact that it doesn't look quite right in Safari. You know I would worry if it completely breaks in any other browser, because then you're not really developing for the web. You're developing for a browser. But um, you know you, if it if things are out of alignment in other browser, you know if you happen to fire up your personal copy of Safari and it's like eh, it doesn't look quite right, but you know it's okay, then that's fine. You know. Ashley, when you're doing, what kind of experience have you had in terms of, you know, developing for one browser sites versus, you know, uh, I call it single browser sites versus, you know, sites that you know many different types of browsers are going to be visiting. You know, what are, what are uh, things that? You, yeah. I would say uh, designing for one browser is a lot easier than defining or de designing for multiple browsers. You'll find that uh, even though your code validates and looks nice in one browser it can look completely different in another. Oh, yeah. And that's where it can be quite confusing because usually validation is supposed to mean that it'll look the same in every browser, but that's not necessarily true. You really do have to have several versions of browsers and even check on different operating systems in order to ensure that your users can still navigate your site. It's kind of the difference between theory and practice, right? Yeah. Well, let me, well, I would disagree in, in oh. one sense, which is okay. that validation never actually meant that things were supposed to look the same. Validation was only ever supposed to mean that the document was well formed and conformed to the language. Uh, but if you look at the history of the web, when browsers started out, there was no way to control what elements looked like as an author. The user had control over what every single element looked like, but didn't. So, you know, you could validate a document. You could have a perfectly valid HTML2 document, and it would look, you could have two different computers with browsers copies of Mosaic configured two different ways and the documents look totally different. It was never a design principle of the web that everything should look the same. That came, that was imposed on it later, basically. Um, so so. Uh, what, 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 what's the status now then? You know, where, where, where yeah. do you... Yeah. We're still sort of there, except the author has a lot more control than they used to. And the user actually has, in, the, in some ways, a lot less. It's not as easy for a user to define how they want documents to look. I mean, I can write a user style sheet and have it applied to every page I visit so that table elements are never displayed, ever, no matter what the author does. Now, I can do that. Probably a lot of the people listening to this, you know, this webcast can do that. Most of our users either, you know, don't know how to do that, and even if they did know how to do that, wouldn't bother, right? But, you know... This, the effort to make things look the same is understandable from a design point of view and from a brand consistency point of view, but the web is not something that was built that way. Flash was, right? That's, that's sort of the flip side 
the, 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 there are two sides of that coin, right? The flash was everything looks exactly the same everywhere unless you can't unless the thing doesn't run flash and then you can't see it at all. As opposed to the web, which was things might look different, but you can see it in a lot more places, right? The the web on on an on an ASCII mode browser looks on a mobile phone looks totally different than it does in my copy of Firefox, even though it's the same website. That's the way the web was built. So that's sort so of a fundamental design principle. So you're, you're saying viva la difference then. You know, if, if things move from, change from one thing to the next, maybe that's fine. Um, yes, viva la difference in the, in the sense of we can't really get around it, so we may as well, you know, accept it. Embrace it. Yeah. Ashley, what do you think? What's your perspective on that? What do you think? Well, I do agree that validation never was meant to ensure that it would look exactly the same. I think exactly I same. misspoke a little bit on that. It's a common uh, misconception of my students that the validation is supposed to ensure your code is perfect. So I should okay. mention okay. that. <laughs> that uh, it can be confusing from that standpoint because a lot of people feel that, well, validation, my code's correct. Why is the browser showing it differently or causing some of the divisions to render in a way that does not allow them to be usable. Mm. So uh, I'm not so sure I enjoy all of the differences that the browsers create, but you do have to learn to live with it when you're designing in the web. Well, it, it, cause I know what you're saying because, it, it, and it's not so much, you know, Ashley Craft's preference it all has to be the same. I mean, you're responding and, and have to be very uh, sensitive to what end users want. And if, the, if end users see some sort of inconsistency, they can get real snarky real quick, can't they? Well, not just your end users, but if you're working with a marketing department who has yes. specifically designed something, they want it to look the same in every single browser, you can wind up doing a lot of extra effort trying to ensure there's a similar experience. So you, you're dealing with the nature of something that, that uh, is not consistent, and then and making it consistent. That, that sounds like a full-time job. <laughs> it, it is yeah. for many of us, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, now, so as you have invested, the two of you, in, a, in technology, uh, the things that I wanted to bring up is, you know, you need to make sure that you are investing your time in standards-based type things. Uh, Eric, you brought up the whole idea of uh, the importance of web native things, usually things that are created via standards. Um, Ashley, you, you bring up the idea that consistency is a very important thing. Uh, and Eric both of, and Ashley, both of you brought up the idea that you know, Flash is something that tends to be consistent from one platform to the other. I just wanted to point out, too, that there are a lot of, there's another issue I think it has to do with corporate support of the platform. Obviously, Adobe has their platform, uh, Flash and Flex. Microsoft has theirs with Silverlight. Um, and one thing that is interesting about Microsoft's platform, I suppose, is that you know, they own so much of it. They own the browser. They have the, the server-side languages, .NET. They have the, you know, the web server uh, and all of these things. And so it seems to me that Silverlight is an interesting unified kind of approach. Uh, and Ashley, you, I think you've had an insight about how Silverlight is something that is easier for developers to implement, possibly, than maybe other technologies. Well, in the event that they know .NET, then uh, Silverlight should be easier for them to work with than, say, something like Flash. So in those instances, if you're already a developer in a certain language and you can port that knowledge over into a language that might have similarities, then that might be your better bet than trying to learn something completely new. Sure, that makes sense. That makes sense. What about the whole? I mean, you know, you don't want to get into this game of trying to predict the future, but you know, how do you determine um, as much as possible what the market will support and things like that? How do you go about making sure that this is a technology that, uh, as you adopted, Ash, as you adopted it, that your customer won't be led down some sort of blind alley, like, oh, well, yeah, that technology somehow has become passe. How do you avoid that sort of thing? Uh, uh, we'll start with Ashley first and then with Eric. Um, and that is kind of hard to tell in the beginning when new technologies are coming out and they're being compared to each other. Sometimes you can wind up with a technology that may, in a couple of years, wind up being obsolete, but it really is the best decision at the time to use that for what the company is trying to do. 
such as Netflix really put a lot of effort into going to Silverlight for their videos and that was the best decision for them in that it reduced their uh, tech support costs and also increased their ability to serve their users. So even if four years down the road Silverlight disappears, Netflix right now is doing a lot better. Yeah, yeah, really good point, really good point. Major League Baseball uses it, I think, as well. Eric, what's your perspective on that? I think it's probably the same. Um, you know, in serving video, you know, YouTube recently did an HTML5 test, and they're not obviously converting ev absolutely everything over to, to HTML5-based video. Um, they're still sticking with a blend of Flash and sort of native video and maybe they are too soon right but in four years they might they might uh, have completely abandoned the HTML5 track and switch over to Silverlight or they might have left behind all plugins and going completely native but you know they're I think they're doing what any sensible company would do which is they're they're planning for the future and you know it's it's all well and good to plan for the future but you do have to ship now and so you know, rather than, rather than, I would, you know, if YouTube had said, you know what, no more Flash, everything's to HTML5, we're converting all of our videos, and we're not going to use any Flash anymore, I, that would be a mistake. You know, as much as I'm a fan of doing things web native, that sure. would be a bad move for them right now. It might be a great move for them in five years. You know, we'll see how things turn out. But you, you yeah. always have to, like Ashley said, you always have to make a decision, you know, you have to make a decision based on now, um, more than, than on the future. Than on the future, okay. Uh, I wanted to bring up the idea of flexibility and differentiation. Uh, first of all, I'll start with flexibility uh, when you're choosing a platform. Uh, uh, offline, both uh, Ashley and Eric, you both mentioned that Adobe, for example, one of the reasons for their success, they created a very good development environment. I'm not saying the best or whatever, but a very good one. Uh, uh, Microsoft or Silverlight has created a development environment that you can use. Why, uh, you know, from people who are not as expert as, as the two of you, why is that such an important issue? It obviously, it makes development easier, better ROI, makes things happen on time. Is it, uh, are those the, the major issues? Yeah, pretty much. I would, I, I would think. Um, it's just, you know, being able to do more more quickly. You know, that's right. That's where the where I think the native web is is lagging well behind is in having uh, very powerful development environments. Um, but I think I think Adobe, if nobody else, will fill that gap. They're already making moves in that direction, which I they think seem most to be. of us expected. Yeah, most of us expected that they've already got this environment. Why you know they could just make it output you know web stack technologies instead of Flash or you know. And Microsoft could do the same thing with Visual Studio. They could have it output web stack stuff instead of Silverlight based. Well, stuff, yeah, right? I was so. thinking in terms of uh, you know instead of Visual Studio, you call it Open Studio. Somebody comes out with it and and comes out with a very nice suite of tools to make it just as easy using web native stuff as whether it be .NET or or uh, using ActionScript with Adobe. It, it, it yeah, would make pa sense to me. Palms made a few moves in that direction with web the WebOS. They have a environment right. called Ares, I think, which is focused on mobile, but it's, yeah, I haven't, I, I can't say whether it's a great environment or or not, uh, but it's it certainly looks like a, a powerful development environment, and it, you know, it, in the end, it outputs HTML, CSS, yeah. JavaScript. Hmm. Ashley, what's your perspective on, on that? I would say that, yeah, the development platform can definitely be the difference on whether or not something is adopted quickly or not mainly because some development environments allow people who have very little knowledge of the coding to be able to perform tasks a lot easier that are perhaps already automated or are just a click of the button in the development environment. And it also increases the ability of um, more experienced users to be more efficient in how they create their code. So, yeah, I would say that uh, Adobe is doing a very good job of that. They have mentioned that in CS5 there's uh, support for HTML5, which will probably help HTML5 along with developers. And in their Flash environment, they're actually taking steps to ensure that you can convert from Flash-created files into different formats, such as right. the um, Apple iPhone 
applications. You can go from Flash into their native format, and so you'll still have that development environment available for you. So that way you, vent, you, you kind of avoid the issue of where Apple doesn't allow native Flash, so you just pop it into their format, and life is good that way. Well, at least from the application standpoint. From the application standpoint. Ah, okay. Now, uh, one last thing, and then we'll uh, move on to specifics about the technologies. Um, how important is the idea of support to both, both of you? And by support, I mean documentation, documentation uh, possibly training, but you know, a community of users that you can ping and get information from when you're working with, when you're adopting a technology that you want to get behind, whether it be Silverlight, Flash, or HTML5. Ashley? Um, I would say, for me, documentation, it's definitely a lot more helpful when you're trying to create something with a technology that you may not be very versed in. So um, I would say for new users, it's integral. If you're trying out a new programming language, if you can go onto the web and find a community of users who are very responsive to any issues you're having, then you're probably more likely to feel comfortable with that language than one where nobody seems to answer any questions, there isn't a lot of documentation, and you can't find resources. Hmm. Okay, uh, Eric? Yeah, I, I think community is critical. I, and I actually, even at expert levels, if for no other reason than I think people who become really expert in a technology like to talk to other people who are really expert in a technology. Um, but that that's a different sort of community. I mean, I. I believe in I believe in community so much that I founded a mailing list called CSS Discuss back in 2002 that's still going. And um, the whole point of it was to just for people to talk about, to ask questions about. You know, I need to do this. How can I do it using CSS? And you know, I I tried this and it seemed to work. You know, stuff like that. Um, and the Stack Overflow, the website yeah. is you know it, there's a business now that's built on the entire premise that you know no matter what technical field you're in you know people will look for a community and, and you know anyone from beginners to you know, people who have been doing it for 50 have been you know writing C for 15 years and they've just hit something really obscure and weird and they can post it on Stack Overflow and other people who've been doing C for 15 years can comment so, so the idea of community I, you know, I think both of you agree is, is, is really uh, critical to understand uh, to getting behind a particular technology. So uh, folks, uh, uh, you can go to, is it Meyer Web, to, to, if you want to join uh, the mailing list, these mail mailing lists you're talking about, uh, Eric? Uh, yeah, there's a link from there, or css-discuss.org. CSS, just, did I say that one more time? CSS-discuss, so css-discuss.org, dot .org, and I think .com works too. Anyway. Great. Um, I, I would like to add one more thing. Uh, a really great community can really drive innovation when it comes to a language and figuring out different ways of doing things and pushing along the technology itself, especially when it comes to open source. Having a really great community can help figure out bugs and get them fixed. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, in terms of innovation and fixing bugs, but also, what about ideas for uh, you know development or ideas for design and things like that? Is that uh, also important? Oh, definitely. Um, users can feed off of each other and bounce ideas off of other people who've been in the industry or even people who have a fresh perspective, and get great ideas that way. Very good. Very good. Well, thanks. Well, let's take a look, everybody, in the types of uh, specific technology paths for creating applications. Um, in this case, we'll start with Adobe uh, Flash and Flex, which obviously has support for audio and video. You know, there's great benefit and uh, popular development environments, like we talked about. You know, the market penetration. Uh, I think, from a specific audience perspective, or from the universal, there's X percentage of browsers supporting it. These are all benefits there. Uh, drawbacks, is, uh, as, as Eric has pointed out, uh, it uses an installed plugin. Um, there's also, I think, it, possibly an issue with platform support. Uh, Ashley, you addressed that, though, um, at least in terms of the I application, uh, you know, the you know various uh, 
iPad applications or iPhone applications. Uh, you know, but right now, Flash, Apple does not want to support, you know, they don't seem to want to support anything. Uh, you know, they don't want to support Java, they don't want to support Apple, uh, at least natively. Uh, you know, who develops the standard? Obviously a company. Uh, and, 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 but Adobe is very involved in, in W3C as well. Are performance issues a real concern when it comes to Adobe Flash? People will talk about, oh, it, you know, the reason why certain people don't like it is because it slows the processor down, or it has security issues. Are those the real issues, or is it more that a lot of vendors simply don't want another platform to come in and take control of their hardware? I'm, let's, let's focus on this last question. Uh, we'll start uh, with you, Eric, and then Ashley. Well, can it be both? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you you're know. right. Elaborate on that. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, it, Apple is sort of the poster child, whether positively or negatively, for this in that they refuse to put Flash on their mobile devices. And, you know, there have been claims that it's because it drains battery and, and it runs really slowly, and there there's some evidence to support that, but there's also... But mobile phones especially. I'm sorry to interject right. here, but, you know, mobile phones especially, it could be a real concern. So maybe keep going, though. Right, uh, but then there's also that Apple is one of those companies that does not want to rely on anyone else, does not want to be beholden to anyone else. And, you know, so not having Flash on their on their phones means that if there's a Flash security vulnerability, they, they're not exposed to it. Right. And, you know, and those are both perfectly legitimate reasons to not want Flash on your phone. There might be... I'm not saying that's all there is. <laughs> you know, there's also personalities involved, and there's, you know, sort of strategic jockeying for position. And you know, if this company's up, then this company's down, and all the kind of schoolyard stuff that we think we leave behind. But if you watch business long enough, you realize we never really do. Um, that could also be part of it. You know, um, I, I choose to think, why can't it be all of that? So. Be more, yeah, to be inclusive. Yeah, it makes sense. Ashley, what's your perspective on it? Um, I, I definitely agree that it's probably a little of both, that they really don't want to have to deal with Flash when it comes to any security issues. But then again, any technology that allows control over specific portions of PCs or phones is a possibility of a security flaw. Um, Languages are created by people, and so there may be bugs and mistakes at some point where it allows access to things that they didn't necessarily intend in the beginning. But Flash, from the reports I've been seeing, uh, there are both sides saying that Flash does better than certain technologies and Flash does worse than certain technologies when it comes to saving battery life. So it's probably a very instance-by-instance instance basis that these tests are being done on. So I, I would say that, um, yeah, I can see where Apple would be a little protectionist against Adobe's technology. If it's a lot easier to write programs knowing exactly what you have to deal with than having to work with another company and their programming languages and their bugs and their issues. No, I, I kind of like the way this discussion is going. Uh, here's a, an insight I'd like you to you two to comment on. You've got Apple, and we've been talking about them, but you also have uh, Facebook, who, uh, as far as I, you know, I go in there, and they will support Flash, certainly, but it's not like they use it all the time. And then you have Google uh, that owns YouTube, and they will use, of course, Flash or HTML5. Uh, it'll auto-detect, and, and you have the ability to go either way. But don't you think most of these companies these days uh, kind of are taking what I call a walled garden approach? And by these companies, I mean you know, Google, certainly Facebook, and, and Apple. In other words, come on into our place, into our environment, and stay put, you know, which in some ways is kind of anti-web. But in this way, I think a lot of the, uh, you, you have, uh, these companies have two choices. They either ban certain technologies like Apple seems to have, or they just adopt multiple technologies and then, you know, see which one works out best for their own environment. You know, like, do you see where I'm going? Like, you know, Facebook, they want people to go in, come and stay, right? They don't want people to go to Facebook and then go somewhere else. And it seems to me that what they want to do is either ban certain technologies and say, nope, that's it, we're only going to go with one, or like, like with Google, we'll use anything. What, what is your guys' perspective on that in terms of 
uh, in terms of as developers. Mm. Um, uh, we'll start with that, Ashley. Well, I would say that uh, in some instances, these companies seem to be taking Walmart's approach, where now you can go grocery shopping at Walmart, you can get your tires done at Walmart, you can uh, pretty much spend the whole day doing everything at Walmart so you don't have to go to another store and spend your money. That's why Facebook added email, for example, right? But okay, yeah. Yeah, they're trying to make themselves your whole web experience, which allows them to make a lot more money on things like advertising. If you stay there constantly, then they have a chance to make more money off of you. The only problem with that is, is that when you veer very far off from what you do very well, then you can start having development issues and you have a lot more you need to keep track of that is not necessarily what you core, what your core was doing. So uh, Google is extending very far out into things like energy. They're trying to, to do a lot themselves as well. So it seems to be... Self-driving cars, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's funny because uh, you it's interesting to see Facebook, for example. You know, I guess in doing that Walmart sort of model, um, you know, I, we, I remember the days of CompuServe, and then of course AOL, and now you know Facebook seems to be trying to grab a, a lot of people. I wonder how all that's going to go. Um, Eric, what's your perspective on? That? Yeah, I mean, it's my perspective is really that uh, companies want to, you know companies just naturally want to wall off the, their own gardens, right? They create a garden and they really like their garden and they don't want kudzu coming in from the outside, which is how they sort of perceive anyone else's stuff, yeah. right? So yeah. Facebook, you know, will literally do stuff, <coughs> excuse me, I've seen at least screenshots where you're on Facebook and you click on a link and it will put up an interstitial page that basically says, you're about to go out to the big, scary World Wide Web. Are you sure you want to leave our nice little walled garden with the pretty flowers and the farms that you can build? And right. um, Companies just have that tendency. Uh, Google is actually one of the few companies that, that explicitly went the other way. Right? Yeah. Their, their, their whole point was, find what you're looking for and go away. You'll be back. <laughs> right? Yeah, you'll come back for various compelling reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and 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 now they're really branching out, maybe a little too far. I don't. I don't know. I'm not an industry analyst, but um, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, there, there's always the tendency to, to to build higher and higher walls to keep your garden as perfect and pure, you know, as as it can be in in con conformance with the the uh, vision um, that that the company has. But I I think if history shows us anything, you mentioned CompuServe. You mentioned AOL. Yeah. Those walled gardens, eventually the walls came down, or worse still. They came cr crashing down, yeah. Or worse still, things got so bad inside the walls that, that the walls stayed, but everyone left. <laughs> yeah, they, they tunneled, right? <laughs> they tunneled out. Yeah, Yeah, or, you know, or found the door. I was like, you know, this is, it, I, I'm tired of this garden. There's, there's more interesting things elsewhere, so bye. Very good, very good. Uh, okay, let's talk about Silverlight for a second. Uh, this discussion's great. I just want to make sure we, we discuss a couple other things. Uh, obvious benefits, uh, you know, it's available for you know good development environment, things like that. The drawback still requires an installed plugin. Is there as much market penetration? Although we did talk about um, how Netflix uses it, and Netflix is just getting, you know, huger and huger all the time, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of... Uh, so the fact that you have that kind of support, and and actually you've mentioned before that there are a lot of different organizations. Was it a, a, a political party? I think their site, you know, used Silverlight for all of their streaming before. Is that right? Yeah, um, the Democratic National Convention actually uh, right. put their videos through Silverlight. And that has so, to do with you know the fact that that's good networking on the part of uh, Microsoft, right? You know, good product support. Right. Yeah, Microsoft does have um, a lot of partners that they strategically uh, place when when they're trying That's to right. deploy a new technology like this. What other uh, comments do you folks, uh, Eric or Ashley, have in terms of Silverlight? Which uh, I, I commented yesterday. Uh, what was it? I, I I tend to call it Silver Late because Microsoft's kind of late in the game here. But what do you? Uh, is, what other uh, insights do you have concerning uh, the Silverlight technology? We'll start uh, with uh, Ashley and then Eric. 
Well, with Silverlight, uh, one of the benefits that's mentioned is it can tie into an entire ecosystem. Um, if you can program in Silverlight, you can create the little widgets for the Windows desktop. So you can actually create applications on an OS environment that affects computers as opposed to small widgets that would be on a phone. Eric? Um, you know, I, I think Silverlight is, a, is another example of Microsoft being late to the game, but mm -hmm. learning from what it saw. I mean, it was late to the browser game, right? But they did pretty well for themselves in the browser market in, you know, in the early 2000s. It, we, there are all kinds of, you know, there's a whole argument. In fact, there was a court case, a federal court case, as to how they managed it, but they still managed it. And, you know, the, I think Silverlight, they, they, they've done something similar. They, you know, they, they saw what Adobe did with Flash and said, you know, we could do that, and we could learn from what they did. We don't have to make all the mistakes they made. We can make whole new mistakes for ourselves. But, um, <laughs> but right. and, and something else that Microsoft's really good at, of course, is partnering with people right. like Netflix, like Major League Baseball, like, you know, the Democratic National Committee, and so on. So. And, and so it's that, as a developer, it has to be a very important consideration, knowing that there will be a market for the skills that you've invested. Yeah. HTML5, based on open standards, uh, uh, it's web. It's much more web native because it will be included in all the browsers uh, and in various in various ways is already uh, already there on 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 some level. Support for lots of features, uh, video and audio, of course, native drag and drop, offline storage. Some of these things again are not fully in all of the browsers right now, but they're they're coming. The whole idea, though, is that you don't need to install a plugin. Uh, my question is, and is it has to do with user intervention. Even though Flash comes installed on a lot of uh, desktops and a lot of devices too, uh, the whole idea of HTML5 is there is no plugin to worry about because it's in the browser. But what happens if you still need to upgrade the whole browser now because, well, I'm using a version or a feature of HTML5 that is only available in the latest browsers. Uh, you know, Ashley, what do you think about that? Um, I would say that uh, HTML5, it fails a little bit more gracefully than items that need plugins. If you don't have the correct plugin, then you can't see or utilize the functionality that that plugin was used to create. Whereas HTML5, a lot of its abilities will pretty much allow you to still navigate your site, even if the latest and greatest of HTML5 features aren't there, such as nat or native drag and drop. If that fails, you should still be able to navigate the site if it's been designed properly. So there are fallbacks then, right? That's what you mean by uh, uh, failing gracefully, right? Yes. And Eric, what's your perspective? Um, really much the same. Um, definitely one thing that browser makers need to do and have been doing is make it easier to upgrade a browser. Now, I realize that sometimes people are in environments where they can't do that. Uh, you know, if you're user at a public library terminal, you can't upgrade the browser most likely. Um, if you're in a corporation that has a specific official browser and replacing it is a, you know, writable offense, then that's, you know, you're, you're stuck there. But, you know, it's just making it easier to upgrade the browser is, and, and exerting pressure to do so, I think is really important. Because that's, that's what things like Flash and Silverlight do, right? You go to a site and it the, the, the area where something's supposed to happen says, you need Flash Player 10.1 or you know, whatever. Um, you know, you have Flash Player 9.0, you need to get it upgraded. Um, and you can't do anything until you upgrade it. You know, the web isn't like that. It's not designed that way, so it's harder to do. But, you know, browser makers sort of leaning a little bit more on users to say, hey, you're behind, you know, we have security fixes, you need to upgrade, right? We'll make it really easy, like click this button and it'll just happen for you and we'll put you right back where you were. Right, that's that's the sort of thing, and right. some browsers do that, and, and I think they just need to get better and better at that, and that will that will help some of the problems there. No, that makes sense. <laughs> no, it makes perfect sense. Now, let me. Uh, there are a couple of questions that people have been uh, uh, com coming up with, and I want to uh, to address. Um, uh, I, I was going to basically show uh, how the CIW products uh, from foundations here uh, all the way through. Uh, site designer 
um, and through our developing products, uh, show you how to get to uh, the various languages. For example, the Adobe Design Specialist will uh, explain not only how to use JavaScript and things of that nature, but also Flash. And then we have development titles that uh, go into JavaScript, so you can use Ajax and, and various types of tools. But beyond that, I want to answer a couple of questions. One of them, the best way to ensure your, that your web page supports various browsers, uh, we already kind of addressed that question, and you know, install lots of browsers and, and test. You can also go to a site called browsershot.org that will actually, you put in your URL of the website you're working on, and it will show you lots of different browsers from various platforms. So browser, browsershots.org is a great way to go. But we've unmuted somebody. Uh, his name is Scott Nason. Scott, are you there? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, um, and uh, Scott, you have a, a question uh, of uh, Ashley and, uh, and uh, Eric. Uh, why don't you go right ahead and see what we can do in the next uh, a couple of minutes before we have to conclude. All right. Um, we're a small community college, and... Um, we're the only program on campus that uses Adobe products for in a Windows environment. Mm -hmm. um, and we're having considerable difficulty with Adobe in updating our software, which is currently CS4. Uh, we've converted most of our classroom computers, which were standalone, to thin clients. And um, we're, hosting, we're trying to host all of our software on servers and made them, make them available to the individual classes. When a student logs in, they would have the software for the class that they're enrolled in. And I've talked to uh, uh, Adobe personnel, and um, they are very um, hesitant to deal with uh, hosting the software except through a uh, campus-wide license. Well, we've got about 6,000 FTE, and we've got about 70 students in our program. And our college leadership refuses to spend that kind of money for a campus-wide uh, license for such a small program. Um, the other issue is that we're well, moving. Scott, so Scott, are you are you saying that that I mean, to me, I, I would just go more web native or something like that and, and teach the, you know, uh, an Ajax platform or something. I mean, well, I know, I, Photoshop is one of the biggest issues uh, because one of our um, classes is advanced um, web design mm -hmm. and uh, uh, graphics. I mean, advanced graphics for the internet and. We've been using Photoshop and don't really know another alternative. Hmm. Like the, uh, the GIMP, for example, might be an interesting alternative. Well, we use that. Yeah, we use that in our introductory class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could get pretty advanced with it. Let me uh, just stop you real quick as we're getting near the top of the hour. What perspectives do you have on this in terms of uh, you know practical education? Uh, uh, Ashley, uh, we'll start with you, Ashley, and then uh, Eric. Well, I can uh, definitely understand why Adobe is balking at uh, helping in that situation. They make a lot of money off of those licenses. Um, I was kind of curious, uh, is it possible for your students to be able to use um, the 30-day trials? Some of the books, when you're teaching Photoshop, will give you several 30-day trials, like four different disks, that will allow you to install it and reinstall it in order to finish the class. Uh, we've just used the 30-day trial in the introductory class, so they do get exposure to Photoshop. And I do the same in Dreamweaver. I use Expression Web first, and then let them spend about a month in uh, Dreamweaver. You know, you could virtualize too, and that can help you with that. But I would also, I, can, I like things like Composer, for example. You know, free. Uh, you could use something like that. Uh, Eric, do uh, you have any perspective uh, on this? I. Uh... I mean, you know, there's the part of me that, that wants to answer the way you did, James, which is to say, well, just teach them web-native technologies and tell Adobe to go jump. But yeah, it's not that easy, right? That's, that's no, not it necessarily, isn't. Yeah. it's not preparing them to be, to, to enter the market. You know, it's, they, right. they can't, you can't ignore Flash, for, you know, if, if you're trying to train them. So, you know, it's, that's, it's always a problem with licensing and all that 
kind of stuff. I mean, I, I worked at a university for many years, and, and back in those days, it was the fight we had was over things was was with people like Microsoft over things like Office. You know, they they would I remember. we would want to do it one way, and they would want to do it another because it made them a lot more money, but it cost us a lot more. And yeah, I I I wish I could solve that, but that's a lawyer thing, sadly. Okay, yeah, you know, no, go ahead. I'm sorry, Scott, I couldn't quite hear you. Okay, Microsoft is working with us, and they have a program for colleges like our size. Um, you know, it's like $750 a year, and we get everything but Office. But wow. Adobe is just not interested in even really talking to it. They say they are, but they're not. Hmm. Too bad. I, yeah. I, you know, I tend to again. I, I would tend to uh, if you can't do that and you can't swing it, then you're going to have to go with alternatives such as the yeah. GAMP uh, composer, things of that nature. I, that's yeah. the only way I can think about it, uh, unless you can, uh, you know, <laughs> do the do the unthinkable, raise tuition or charge lab fees and things, so that students know that they can get that uh, software. Yeah. All right. Appreciate. Hey, thanks, Scott. Uh, good to hear from you again. Uh, we'll have yeah. to uh, go out to dinner uh, again soon when I'm in okay. the area. Yeah. Well, everybody, I want to thank uh, uh, you for everybody on the on the line here for participating. I especially want to thank uh, uh, you, Ashley, for uh, uh, taking time out of your valuable day, and you, uh, Eric, uh, for, uh, Eric, for the same in the time that you spent with us on this webcast and, and the one yesterday. Thank you very much. Well, glad to do. Glad it. to be here. Everybody, we're going to be talking next uh, next month, Wednesday, December 8th, creating a standards compliant website, tips, tricks, and traps, how to go about doing that. And so uh, Steve and I, will, and I will be talking about various uh, ways that you can go about doing that, practical ways to go about, about it. So we look forward to seeing you there. You can keep an eye on us at, uh, um, on our, uh, our CWCertified.com site as well as on Twitter to learn more. So thank you very much for your time, everybody. If you want to get a hold of us, you can certainly get a hold of our Director of Marketing, Barbara Sandra, at, uh, uh, at the number given, as well as get a hold of me. No problem at all. So once again, uh, Eric uh, and uh, Ashley, I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Bad man. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's event. Uh, sorry, James. Thanks, for everyone, no worries, for participating in today's event. I'm going to go ahead and conclude our recording now, and I uh, wanted to wish everyone a great day.